All right, let's get going. For those of you who don't know me, I uh, have been around developing code since 1978 as a developer until comparatively recently, about 10 years ago, when I began focusing more on UX design. I still do write code. So I come from that developer perspective, and I understand something about UX design, talking to developers that I'm not sure that, that some designers really get, and that is that the touchy-feely way a lot of designers look at UX design doesn't really work very well with developers. So I talk about it more from a science background, show examples, and this session will get into some of the science behind how users actually see their user interfaces so that it's not just somebody's opinion that it happens. And I have tests and such that will let you see it in your own mind. This becomes progressively more important because people are used to dealing with apps like the one over there on the left, but what do, they look, what do they look at in their companies? Probably something more like what's on the right. And so the user expectations are starting to rise and, and, and we're expected to do better even in routine business software. Understanding what your users see when they look at a screen is one of the key foundations of doing good UX design. If you don't really understand how the users see what you create, you're kind of fumbling around in the dark. You might do A-B testing, and A works out better than B, but why is A better than B? Is there a C that's superior to either of them that you might know if you understood something about the principles? So that's why knowing this stuff is extremely helpful. Um, there's a, there's a, an example that I'm not going to do, but I, will, I would urge you to do it. Some of you may have seen this. Um, it's a video of two teams passing basketballs around. Have you seen this? How many of you have seen that video? Yeah, but over a little over half the audience. So I won't do it since less than half probably have not seen it, but I would, I would encourage you to go out and see it, and it will, it will really surprise you, I think, something about how you see things. But I'm going to substitute with that another test that kind of shows the same thing. I'm going to show some slides. I have three slides, and I'm going to show each one for just a few seconds each. And each slide will have drawings of common household tools that you might find around your house or your workshop. Your task is how many to, to count the number of slides, figure out how many slides contain a hammer. You ready? I'm only going to show each slide for just a second or two. Okay, so how many hammers did you see? Two hammers, that's fine. Um, how many pairs of scissors did you see? He says he saw two. Anybody else got a clue? How about wrenches? Did you know there were wrenches? Screwdrivers. See, your brain was primed to look for what I told you to look for, and it sort of filtered out the rest. That demonstrates a design principle called inattentional blindness. Um, the, the, it's, it's an example of a design principle that's based on how our eyes see things, how we perceive the world. And you can't really get around it because the bulk of your users are going to behave in a very consistent way based on this principle. Here's the, the, this particular design principle is based on the way the eye works. Uh, do you guys remember biology? There was a term called a fovea. Does that word mean anything to you? You probably learned it in biology for a test and promptly forgot it. It's the part of the retina that gives you high-resolution vision. It's actually pretty small. Um, it gives you about this amount of resolution when you hold a quarter or like this bottle cap. Hold that at arm's length. That's about how much the fovea sees. It really isn't very much. And what the, the, the visual system is doing is constantly moving that area around to what it thinks is important. And the rest is pretty much filled in with a convincing fake. You don't actually see it. You don't actually perceive it because you don't have high enough resolution to resolve it. If we, were, if we had a brain and visual system big enough to perceive our entire visual system, our heads would be the size of a watermelon. It would take that much in the, in, in the terms of neural mass. Well, from an evolutionary perspective, that just doesn't make any sense. So you remember that screen I showed you a few minutes ago? You really didn't see it when I showed it. What you really kind of saw at first was something about like this. When your eye was looking at, because you tend to look at the upper left corner first. 
So some of you probably saw, noticed on that screen that it was Sherlock Holmes. But you almost certainly did not notice a lot of the other stuff. For instance, if the eye darts over here, you see that there's something about raster possums. Well, that's obvious gibberish. But did you realize that it was gibberish the first time you saw it? Most of you may not have even done that because you didn't really have anything to direct you and look around, so you only see small parts of what's on the computer screen at any particular time. That's just the way your eyes work. It's something we can't get around. It's the reason, for example, that all those error messages that people put on status bars at the bottom or at the top are pointless. People are not really seeing them. So that's a design principle, inattentional blindness, based on the way that the, the, uh, the brain works because that's, I mean, you think that everything is clear because your eye just keeps moving around, but it's not really. Your eye's not really seeing all that. And in addition to just the way that the visual system works, as I said, with the, with the whole example of what tool are you looking for, there's this concept called priming. Priming means that you are heavily influenced by what you expect to see. What you see is, in a sense, an artifact of what you expect to see. Let me show you an example from earlier in this week, actually. Um, across the, the parking garage, across, as some of you probably parked in the parking garage across the street, I was over there getting some coffee on the other side of it, and I came back in to the lowest level and came from the stairs to the, to the lowest level to the elevator. So I'm walking up to the elevator. Now, if I'm walking up to an elevator, what do I expect to see? What am I looking for? A button to call that elevator. If I'm on the lowest floor, there's probably just one. What shape do I expect it to be? Round. So I walk up to the elevator from the stairs, and I see this. And I walk right over there and press it. And the security guy comes on and says, yes, this is security. No, I'm sorry. I just meant to call the elevator. And you could tell from his tone of voice, this happens to him 12 times a day. All right? This is a little bit more expansive view. There is an elevator button there, and I did find it. But when I walked up, I expected to see a round elevator button. So I just went to the, I was coming in from that, that side where the security button was. So I just pressed it. And here's the thing about it. The average person will do that and go, oh, God, that was dumb. No, see, I don't understand design, and I don't assume that I'm stupid because I made a mistake. I presume it's bad design. That thing should have been colored red or something. There are various visual indicators that would make, and make it a different shape. Don't make it look like an elevator button. So that's an example of priming. There's also a... Um, a related principle, I'm going to show more software examples that kind of combine some of these in a few minutes. There's, a, there's another related principle called framing. What you see is influenced by what you expect to see from previous experiences, the frame that you, your mental, your, your, your mind is in. And this is based quite a bit on experience. Um, so if I go into a kitchen, I expect to see a stove. I mean, that's just a part of the usual setup of a kitchen. I expect one to be there. They've done studies on this. If, if, if you set up a kitchen without a stove in it and you just kind of tour people through the house and, and, you, and you get them on out, they will remember a stove being there despite the fact that it was not there. I saw this when I moved into my own house 20-something years ago uh, because the sunroom was sunken. And you don't really expect that, right? Your frame for a house is that things are kind of, the floor is pretty much level. So when we bought the house, my wife was talking about, yes, uh, let's move the, uh, let's move the, we can wheel the exercise equipment in and out from the sunroom to the living room. I, no, you can't. It, it's, it's a drop off there. She's, it is? Her mind remembered it as being flat because that's what she expected. And this applies in software when we start to get people in a, particularly in a rhythm of what they expect. So just if you imagine that we've got five, four pages in this process and you've got back and neck to certain, in a certain order and then you change it up on the bottom, you're going to confuse users and they're going to press the wrong one. I will tell you a story of when I did that. American Airlines had this very problem in a different, a slightly different form. They recently fixed it, but it was up about 18 months. It, very, very poor design. So let's, uh, let's talk a bit about how we were doing here. 
This was the fourth screen in getting myself a flight on American. And all of the previous screens have had a button in the lower right-hand section that said continue. So I just fill in my stuff up at the top, scroll to the bottom, and hit that button. And just throw away everything I just put on the first three screens. Now, why did they do that? Well, they were thinking, oh gosh, we should always right align our buttons, and we shouldn't show buttons they can't use. No, see, you put those two together, and now you are violating a design principle because people expect there to be a continue button right there. In fact, I would bet you big money that there were people that called American Airlines and said, your software has a bug. I hit the continue button, and it threw away everything. I guarantee there are people who saw continue there because that's what they expected, and, and people are heavily Heavily influenced by that. See, the problem here was that I hadn't filled in credit card information yet. And until I fill in credit card information, it doesn't show the button to go forward. It, at that point, it moves that start over button and then puts the correct button in its place. That's just bad design, folks. They did eventually take that out. I can tell you as a... Based on my experience in UX design, American Airlines was losing money every day that was up. Every day. Context uh, influences what you expect to see also. Suppose I tell you you're looking at a campus map. Okay, the next slide's a campus map. And you see roads and you see buildings and such. Okay, you see that? And then I tell you, actually, no. There's a word. If I take all that other stuff away and tell you there's a word in there, can you see it? Did you see it before? Very few people do. Because your visual system was expecting a map, and I told you there would be buildings on it, and so your visual system saw that and thought, okay, buildings, cool. And then when I told you to expect something else, your visual system shifted its perception. This particular example plays into to what's called figure ground. It's one of the gestalt principles. We're going to talk a bit more about those further on down in the presentation. Some of you may have seen these in science classes or something. Gestalt principles have to do with how the visual system works. One set, some German scientists figured this out about 100 years ago. Figure ground means that there is a part of our visual field that our brain decides to pay attention to. It decides that's what's important. And the rest is background. But the perception of it, as you saw with the campus buildings, can change. Your, your brain can switch with what the visual system considers the figure and what it considers, considers the ground. So we did that back here. And now if, we, if, if the white becomes the ground, now we see the word. If the black is the ground, we see buildings. So here, this is one of the famous, you may have seen this, this drawing before, very famous figure ground drawing. Do you see a vase or do you see two faces? See, two faces is a little more than half, typically. And, and, but now that you know that they're both, you have the ability to switch what you consider to be the figure and ground. And you go, Billy, what, what could that possibly have to do with software? Actually, you've seen this, this ability to switch figure and ground. We did this in a system we created back in 2008, our first modern UI application. We designed it so that the, in this particular screen, the figure is that data entry screen that you're working on, that maintenance screen for a company. But if you want to enter an address, then you, pr you, press to, you press one of the addresses and say you want to edit it or add a new one, then it switches. It actually animates to do this. So notice that this thing is going to get smaller and some gray is going to come over it. And then the new screen appears in front of it. Now that is a tip-off to the visual system that this is what you need to be looking at. If we didn't gray out and, and do something with that background, now it becomes significantly harder to pick out the thing they should look at from the background, which looks a whole lot like it. So we can influence what the eye sees as figure and what it sees as ground with various tricks like this. And a lot of websites do this now. So, uh, yeah, you go back after, after you finish. A lot of websites do this. So here's Twitter. And, you know, that's just got all of its usual stuff. And then if I click on a tweet to get information, I get, I get something like this. You've seen this, right? And then the background grays out. And then when I'm finished with that, there's an X up there in the corner that, uh, that lets me go back. A 
So fairground ground is very important, but you have to understand the fact that you can switch it and what you're trying to do to direct attention. If you don't understand that, then the concept of figure ground can lead you into the wrong conclusion about things. The visual studio team did this in 2012. You remember that toolbar that was washed out and almost no color and it was really hard to find things? A true story, about six months after it was released, I was doing a demo of some WPF stuff, and I commented out some code using a button up there, and I heard a gasp from the audience. And I looked at the guy, and he said, I've been looking for that button for six months. Okay, the toolbar was that washed out. Here's the, here's the really bad news. The way it looked there is the way it was looked in release. But I saw it when it was rolled out in beta to a group of, of MVPs up at Microsoft. Visual Studio on Windows MVPs. They rolled it out and it had no color at all. Why were they doing that? Well, they thought, well, what's the figure? The figure is the code window. So we want to focus attention on the code window. Well, I mean, that's fine so far as it goes, but figure and ground can switch based on what you're trying to do. So if the toolbar is completely washed out and it never brightens up when the mouse is over it or anything like that, then it becomes an impediment to people finding what they want when you've dimmed it down that much. I was there in that meeting, no color in the toolbar, and I think the buttons are too small too, but that's, that's, another, that's another discussion. And I, these people beat that team up mercilessly. I didn't say a word. I didn't have to. It was such an obvious problem that everybody else picked up on it, and they did add just a little bit of color. Now, you compare it to what we have now, and you can kind of see the differences between the two. They've, they've learned to put some color back. I still, think, I still think the toolbar could be really improved, but, but they don't like making changes because if they screw it up like they did, they get a lot of grief out of it, and if they don't change anything, everybody just goes, oh, okay. So there's danger in change, but that's the way you improve, so it's tough. You can be primed by your past experience, kind of, in addition to your expectation. I talked a little bit about this already, about sort of the elevator situation. So, um, not only do you expect the button you call an elevator to be round, you expect buttons on elevators to be round too. So you get on an elevator like this one. This is a Marriott in New Orleans, and you get on it. You're not paying much attention to what you're doing. You got luggage, maybe you got kids or whatever, and you press. Well, a surprising number of people here are pressing the placards instead of the button. How do I know that? Because the G has its paint worn off. People are getting on there and hitting that placard, despite the fact that, especially on the G, they've already been in the elevator once to go up to their rooms. This is the second time, and they're still making the mistake. So, I mean, this, this entire elevator panel is just a train wreck of bad design. But I want to focus in on the idea that, yeah, I mean, you, you know, you've got bad alignment and you, you know, you've got, and that placard is in the middle of a column of buttons, which is even more misdirection. But, I, yeah, I, I like, that's the, the, uh, the G there is the reason I went back and got my camera and took this picture. Because it's unambiguous evidence of bad design. It's, I mean, nobody can argue with me that this is bad design. And the, uh, um, the, the, the placards there, um, I, there, there are various other problems. We're going to come back to this elevator panel a little later because it also has problems with proximity having to do with the buttons being equal distant between the placards. You look at the, let's say, how do you, how do you know which one is the button for four? Well, you, you have to look at the whole row for that because it's equidistant between four and five which means you're imposing additional cognitive load on whoever gets on this elevator. Well, all those principles apply to software as well. If things aren't cleanly separated into groups, then it becomes difficult for the user to parse it out and figure it out. They have to extend, expend additional effort, and that usually means additional time. Just to show that this problem is, is, not, is kind of ubiquitous, this is in Las Vegas at the signature of a very upscale hotel, by the way. By the way. And it's got exactly the same problem. I was actually on this elevator staying there, and I, I got on with a guy, and he's next to the panel. And he asked me what four I was on, and I said 25, and he, he, point, he pressed the button for 24. And then said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I said, no, don't worry about it. It's bad design. Let me explain to you about the design of the elevator. <laughs> I mean, we're riding 24 floors. So I figured I might as well give him a little, 
mini lesson right there. So that means, for example, that when you, when you start looking at data visualizations and such, your experience guides you to a certain extent as to what you understand. If you're in the propane industry, this makes complete sense to you. This looks like a fuel tank, and the color is right for propane. On the other hand, if you happen to be working with a client that has fuel oil, then the shape of the tank is different, and the color of the fuel is different. So that tips them off immediately. If you're not in that industry, this doesn't necessarily mean anything to you. But if you're in that industry, those things make perfect sense. So there's a, there's a context to, to people in, embedded in people's experience that influences what they see and how quickly. So I talked a little bit about the whole buttons too close to, it doesn't stand out from the, from the, uh, the adjoining placards. By the way, there are some good elevator designs, and I'm giving you homework of, of, of now you should notice when you see an elevator that does it right, that, that groups the, the button close to the placard and doesn't make the placard round because if a placard's round, it's more likely to be confused with a button. So you can now look at that. But let's talk about some of those, that, particular, that principle particularly about the equidistance. Um, it, it has to do with... Another Gestalt principle, I already talked about figure ground. This Gestalt principle is called proximity. So another true story, I, uh, I was at a hotel in Amarillo, Texas. Got out the elevator with all my luggage and saw this sign. And I'm in room 207, so I start walking that way and get two doors down and realize I'm, I'm gone the wrong way and go back and see the entire sign. You see, I should have gone the other way, but for the range in which my room number is, 201 to 223, which arrow is closer? The one beneath it. So the eye naturally groups things that are close together and assumes they are related. Remember, you don't see it all. You only see what you, you're, you think you need to look at. So I just wanted to find out where 207 was. I don't care where all the other rooms are. So that led me to go the wrong way. This sign would be fine if, if those arrows would just be moved down two or three inches because then they would be grouped with their description and number ranges properly. So in software, you see this mistake made by people like Amazon? And I, I, here, I'm telling you my own mistakes because, as I said, I don't assume that I'm stupid. When I make a mistake, I assume that the, de the person designing the software or the, or the object just, just is not tuned in to good design. So here, I'm, it's one of those deal of the day pages. And I go, yo, man, 128 gigabytes, USB 3. I travel a lot. I need storage. This is like two or three years ago. It's not as big a deal now. But then that was a good deal. So I, I, I go, yeah, I want to check one of those. There's another button to put things in the shopping cart. You can check as many as you want. So I, I, you know, I go right down below it, and I check that thing and go down and check the button and go over to the shopping cart, and my USB thing is not there. Have you spotted why not? The correct check mark for that item is the one that's further away above it. But my eye isn't looking for that. The one that's closest to the description of the thing I'm getting is below it. So they're, they're, they're yet, an, even people like Amazon do it. See, Gestalt principles like proximity and figure ground come out of this structure of the human visual system and the way it sees things. Uh, there's proximity, common, figure ground. We've also got similarity, common fate, continuity. I'll, I'll briefly look at all of those because they're all pretty important. They all are based on the way the visual system works, which is the first thing that happens is the retina does some tuning and optimization of the information to accentuate edges, for example. That's stage one. 
In stage two, the, the stuff that the retina is seeing is assembled by the nervous system, by the optic nerve, actually. Some of that processing happens in the op optic nerve, and some of it happens at the beginning of the visual cortex, so that shapes are kind of assembled into groups, and lines are assembled into shapes. And that is unconscious, and it happens very quickly, as in a fraction of a second. And then you impose your experience upon it to understand more meaning about the shape or the group. So gestalt comes out of stage two for the most part. So this is unconscious. It takes place before conscious interpretation. Uh, and you can change those perceptions as we've seen in figure ground, but that takes additional cognitive work. So gestalt proximity is one of those, that things that are grouped together are assumed to be related. There's also the issue that um, if, you get, if you make things too close together, you also have problems with people inadvertently hitting the wrong thing in kind of their imprecise way of doing things, especially on mobile apps. I actually worked on a, 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 some, some videos for a system that it's, it, was an, it was a mobile app designer. And it had the same thing, what we would call code behind. You would put JavaScript in code behind. And that's in the edit buttons where you put it there. But there were some things that you could run and get a whole bunch of code pumped in there um, automatically. And if the thing on the side is blue, that means that you've got some of that code in there. But that button, where the link is, meant I want to wipe out all the code behind that's in this event. And first of all, the iconography is awful. And secondly, there was no confirmation. So if I'm going for the edit button, but I'm in a hurry and I slip a little bit over to the side, I can accidentally wipe out an hour's work just like that, and there's no way to get it back. Now, I griped about this, and they did eventually put up confirmation, a confirmation dialogue, which we're going to talk about later, but um, it, it, that, was, that was at best a brute force fix. This should have been better designed from a layout, et cetera, perspective. Right there's the edit button that I was talking about, and there is the thing that wipes out all previous work. I, I couldn't believe the design when I saw that. So, uh, as I said, do I have this this again? Oh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I think I think I moved those slides and left left them in the old place too. Um, oh no, I'll put it here because there were other some other principles in addition to Gestalt that that were violated consistency and symmetry and alignment. Um, that, that, that elevator also had those principles violated as well. But in this session, I don't have time to go into a lot of the detail there. So, sorry. I thought I'd taken that down. Yeah, put that in there again. The proximity principle. I thought I moved those, but I guess I just copied them. Uh, the proximity principle it works inside your mind, and I'm going to show that to you. I'm going to show you a diagram of stars, four-pointed stars. And it's going to be just an array of them. And I need for you to immediately sort of just say out loud what you see, whether you see rows of stars or columns of stars. You ready? Rows or columns? Yeah. Okay. Everybody point sees that. Rows or columns? You see columns now, despite the fact it's the same size array and the stars are identical, the only thing that changes is the spacing. But the spacing is enough to cause your brain to change what it thinks, which items it thinks are grouped together. Well, it turns out the proximity is not the only thing that causes your visual system to group. You see rows or columns now. Now most people see rows. Kind of depends on their sensitivity to color, but most people see rows now. Despite the fact that this is exactly the same, that's what I just showed you. The only difference is that now some of the stars are colored. So that helps you see that color causes the visual system to automatically group so that something like this can, can be grouped differently. That gestalt principle is called similarity, that the visual system will group things that are similar to one another in size or color or shape. Size isn't very strong for that, but color and shape are, are very strong in causing grouping. So you saw the, um, the, the rows that you get here. Let's look at the next one. You see rows or columns in this. And it's the shapes that are doing it. The similarity of shapes is causing your visual system to see it that way. And these Gestalt principles have been used a long time in things like charting. So proximity helps you know that this is a, 
a, a, a period. All these things are happening at the same time, whereas similarity by color helps you follow a category across a, time, a range of times. So Gestalt has been used for a while, but um, I think most developers aren't, aren't as aware of it as they, they should be. And, and the Gestalt principles, that, that sort of the inverse of the similarity, is that you can make things stand out very easily. If I tell you to find the triangle here, you don't, do any, you don't expend any cognitive effort to do that. Your visual system does that for you automatically. If I tell you to find the green star, again, it happens automatically. So you, respecting these principles will give you better interfaces. Violating them will induce people to either be confused or have errors. And as I said, big companies do this all the time. This is the Southwest mobile app, I think, as it exists today. And I installed it on my new iPhone a couple weeks ago. And, and now, you know, I've got my boarding pass. And, and I'm looking at the thing, thing up there, save to phone, GPay. Well, first of all, is that one button or two? And secondly, what does GPay have to do with... See, my mind assumes there's a relationship there because of the proximity and because of the grouping. My mind... So if I save the phone, am I going to pay something to G or to Google? I mean, I, I, that's a legitimately realistic perception for a user to have just because they group that together. And I, I, I don't understand that at all. I mean, there's, I can give you four or five different ways... Assuming that I'm right, and it really is two separate buttons, I can give you four or five better designs in 10 minutes. And yet, whoever's doing the apps for Southwest just screwed up and didn't respect a basic principle concerning how the visual system works. The eye also tends to follow things to completion. That's called gestalt continuity. You begin to track things. It will go in the same direction until, until it changes to something else. And if you violate continuity, that allows you to draw the eye's attention to things. So that, for example, if you've got a timeline of things, that offset is seen instantly by the visual system. You don't, again, you don't have to work at it. And can you figure out just from, from looking at this why it's offset? It overlaps with another item. So we use that capability of the visual system. I mean, look, we could have put that, we could have just lined them all up, and wouldn't have that have been consistent? And the alignment would have been so pretty. And we could have put overlaps with previous item as some text in there. Functionally speaking, that works, but it doesn't leverage the user's visual system to figure it out fast enough. They would tend to overlook that sort of thing until they had to look at it a long time and learn. Okay, you guys having fun with this? This is interesting stuff. You haven't asked any questions yet. Everybody's going, yeah, well, you know, just it's like watching the Discovery Channel, Billy. <laughs> you don't ask the guy questions on the screen. You just sort of let him go on to the next thing. I'm sorry? Is it normal to see grids instead of rows or columns? Well, if they get kind of close enough together, it's normal. Um, and, and people vary in terms of how much separation it takes to start to see rows or columns. So there are people that it takes more separation to see rows and columns. The effect is pretty much in everybody, but it varies in terms of how much separation you need to trigger it. Hang on, I'm, I'm confused about where I am. Is that because I, I did some changes to this? Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, I know where I am now. All right, let's bring some of this stuff together. I want to I wanna show you an example where I'm going to bring some stuff together, some of these principles, and, and, and talk a little bit about leveraging them in, in, in a fudged-up software example. So le, this is going to be kind of hearkening back to the inattentional blindness thing, okay? So I'm going to show you a, a screen with car, a card view of sports equipment. And it's got, you know, the description, it's got the price, it's got a little symbol for what kind of sports, a little graphic for what kind of sports equipment it is. And uh, I'm going to leave it up for about four seconds, and I want you to tell me how many footballs you find in that card view. I think it's about three, three or four rows of five or six each. You ready? Oh, yeah, it's six, six, seven across, three down. Okay, find those footballs. 
you see three footballs? Sometimes that's not quite enough time. You might only see two because it's kind of, it's a jumble. It's a jumble on purpose to show this example. Okay, that's fine, but uh, did you see, how many baseballs did you see? Or basketballs? Tennis balls, soccer balls. See, again, it's just an example of your eye didn't take in that because your goal-directed purpose, your task, was to figure out footballs. So that's partially inattentional blindness, but there's lots of interesting ways to get around it, and they have to do with, um, with various design principles. So there's a design principle that says that the size and position of things in the real world if they are reflected in a software interface, people will understand the, con the information more quickly. So if I change the size of those sports equipment items to more closely reflect their real world size, now is it easier to find the baseballs than it was? Yeah, see, that, is, that helps you, but you're leveraging the visual system. You can almost think of that visual system as sort of the GPU for your brain. You know, do you remember those old computers that did rendering on the motherboard and they were just really slow? And you get a good GPU and now you've got capabilities for doing graphics and visuals much, much more quickly. Well, that's the part of your brain that kind of corresponds to that. So if you're doing something on your computer that, is, that needs the GPU, you kind of make sure that it uses the GPU, don't you? You don't kind of route around it. Well, that's what you're effectively doing when you put information in front of people that ought to be processed by the visual system, but you're making them do it with cognitive means instead. And the worst design pattern to make people do that is a data grid. Because the data grid, for the most part, is just text and numbers. Some people put a little bit of colorization in there, but very rarely is that data grid enhanced with the ability for people to actually see things with their visual system instead of parsing it out with their conscious system. All right, so, but we've got more design principles we could use for this. We, we, know, that, we know that things close together are visually grouped. We discovered that in Gestalt Proximity. We know that we can group things by color. Color helps grouping. Well, why don't we put all that together and now do a sports card thing that looks like this? I mean, compare these two, and you tell me which one you think a user would rather use on a daily basis. And none of this is really that hard from a developer perspective. It's just that as developers, it's just like, okay, stick a data grid on there. Okay, I guess we can sort it. But we're not going to do all these other interesting things to help people see the information in front of them. I've actually, you can actually see this in a, I have a, is it this one? Yeah. No, it's this one that I've got all the, you can have this example if you want, that I've got all the different ways, so you can use size. Oh, this one's also got color in the equipment as an interesting alternative to help people find things. And then that background plus grouping, I'll let you see it all. So, so that's, that's, that's the original program I wrote to get those screenshots. We'll get back to this in a minute. Also, as you might expect, because this is kind of the way things work in the world, bigger things are assumed to be more important in some fashion. I mean, if I've got, if I'm looking at carrots, I want the big ones. If I'm, if I'm looking at apples, I want to choose the big one. That's got the most nutrition, et cetera. So there's so, a certain built-in tendency in the brain to assume that bigger things are, are more important. And there's also, of course, the fact that it just it's easier to see them because they're bigger. So the visual system tends to key in on them. That gets us into ideas of information importance, that bigger makes it more important. And color can be used to make important things stand out as well. One of the reasons that, I, that you don't want your app's basic styling to be too colorful, you prefer to have it kind of subtle colors, fairly muted colors, is that to make things stand out with color, it's a lot easier to do that if the base styling is fairly subtle. And again, all you got to do is look at that Windows 8 start screen or even this to realize that companies get it wrong. Those colors are, are considerably muted down from what 
Windows 8 was. But do you remember 8 with all the Power Ranger colors? Windows 8, was, it was horrible. Nothing then stood out because everything was just too colorful. So you want your base styling to have a certain amount of subtlety to it, and that allows you to then apply color and make things stand out that are important. So we, we saw that with the, the tanks. We saw earlier that with the green and the red tanks, we see that. But also notice that this customer is a deadbeat, and that COD really stands out because it comes out against the base color scheme, which is just sort of a dark bluish gray. Also notice that the most important information about this customer is right along the top in a bigger size than the, the routine text. Remember that screen I showed you at the very beginning, the one that's got gibberish on it? Did you, did, how many of you sort of did that look like a screen you've seen before in some business app? Yeah. Kind of, well, did you notice something about that screen? Everything in it was the same size. Every piece of text in it was the same size. And that was what people fell into as a pattern with the tools of the 90s and early, early this century. That they don't, the developers don't tend to think about the fact that things ought, to, the size ought to have something to do with importance. Now, you don't want to have sizes varying all over the place. But here, the fact that it's been 17 days since the last delivery. That's extraordinarily easy to find. We know exactly what their balance is. We know whether or not they're satisfied with our service, with that little graphic over there, the little smiley face. The brain is optimized to see things like that. We could put a satisfaction index of 47 up there or something like that, but, but again, that would take cognitive effort for people to figure out. So how we arrange the information and, and uh, let the user see it has a pretty dramatic effect on their performance. So let's say we've got some information about interactions with a customer. And there they are. We've got eight interactions with that customer in a data grid. And, and if I stare at that data grid long enough, I can probably figure out anything I need. But why would we want people to spend their time staring at data grids? Well, we could enhance the data grid. We could put some shapes in there to say, help them figure out what the payments versus the service items are. Or we could maybe make the amounts bigger if we wanted to. But really, with modern technologies, we can, we can custom design how we want that information to show with different sizes for different things. But we can even do better than that. Suppose I put them on a timeline instead. Now, notice that group at the top. The proximity principle will tip off our brains that those four things that are overlapping are probably related in some fashion. That maybe the and sure enough, we look at it, we go, okay, yeah, there's a there's a service call there for two thousand dollars, and oh, we had to go back because somebody messed up and there's a leak that that needed to be fixed, and then they came in and paid most of it, and then came back and paid some more later. You see, you the the, the user doesn't really have to to think about it, to realize those things are, are probably related in some fashion. They might not be, but because, you know, sometimes things happen at the same time due to coincidence. But there's certainly a possibility that they're related. So if we put them on a timeline, we are leveraging the visual system to help people see that they are related very quickly. All right, you guys doing okay? Some of you look shell-shocked here. It's like, yes, right there. Yes. How many of these principles are translated well to the computer or to the Oh, okay. Well, let me put it this way. The visual principles always apply because that's the way the visual system works. So if I've got very complex data, that raises the bar for me to find a way to, to express it in a way that they assimilate it quickly. Simply dumping a lot of data at people is almost never the right way to do it. There are a few limited exceptions to that. But in general, the more complex the data is, the more I want to be able to leverage these principles to help people understand it because the speed up will be better. Now, if I've got really complex things, I might have to be able to switch what's important. So I've got the ability to, to change the visualization, depending on what it is they're trying to do, to call out different things as being important. 
but I'm still going to give them as much help as I can to leverage the visual system to help them find out what they want to find out very quickly. Did that? And, and I think one of the things you might be hitting at is that if you go to certain kinds of users, engineers would be typical, that they just kind of want you to dump everything in front of them and let them figure it out, let, you, let them figure it out. And the reason they want you to do that is they don't trust you to do a better job than they would do themselves. They don't trust you to understand how they look at that information enough to come up with better ways. They just don't think you can do it. So they will ask you, just dump it all out and I'll figure it out. Because to them, the alternative is you hide things that they can't find or, or you, you put it in such a way that it's harder to understand. So it, in many cases, that's, that's where that tendency comes from to, to just dump it all out there is that the users may ask for it. But that's because they haven't seen anything better. And as an industry, we do a pretty, job of show, pretty poor job of showing them things that are better. So yeah, you, you, can, you can give them a data grid or you can give them a list box or maybe you go, you know, go on up all, all the way up to a timeline. Now these principles, as, as almost anything about people's consciousness can, can be done, can be subverted. Using these principles, you can hide things you don't want people to look at, direct their attention to what you want to, go right past something that you don't want them to see, Doing that, let me, exp uh, let me put this in as strong a terms as I can, doing that is unethical. And I don't think you should work for any company that, that tells you or forces you to do that. And I'm talking about some pretty big companies here. This is, um, this is the, from the Google App Store. And we don't, the, the contrast here is set a little bit high, so it's not quite as easy to see as it should be. Um, but when you, when you see this on a computer monitor, that gray background around um, the, the, this, this app has access to, it's, it's, it's more gray and it's harder to read the text on a, on, a, on a typical computer monitor. Now let me first of all point out the fact that the Hilton app has no business looking at my contacts. All right, there is no excuse for them to look at my contacts. It's a potential security breach. They probably used some framework that came in and just set that as a, as a default and, and lazily didn't do anything about it. So they shouldn't have put that stuff in there in the first place. But notice that what the Google App Store does is notice that big old green install button down there. They don't really want you looking at that stuff. I put, by the, the blue arrows, by the way, are mine. They don't really want you looking at the app permissions. They just want you to install the app. And whether or not the permissions are appropriate, I'm going to be honest with you, Google doesn't care at this point anyway. So that, that app screen leads you to just go ahead and install an app and just let your eye gloss right over what, what, the, what the app has permissions to. Citibank really wants me to go paperless. Now being the paranoid type, and knowing that I can always get my statements PDFs online when I want to, I still take the paper and I throw it in the box. I don't know, Citibank servers might get nuked for all I know. So I guess I'll have bigger problems, I guess, than finding my Citibank statement in that case. But, <laughs> but I still want the paper. And so, I've been, look, I had, my first Citibank card is 1984. So I've been dealing with this a long time. But they've gotten more aggressive about it lately. Yes, paperless, go paperless, look, here. And so they've got two things to bottom, accept or... Manage settings. What's manage settings going to do? I don't know. I'm afraid that what it's going to do is make me do paperless, that there won't be an option not to if I go there. See, I have no idea, but I don't trust them because I don't trust big software companies and big institutions in general. And so now I'm looking, look, I, I just want to go to my accounts. I don't, I don't, what do I do? How do I get to my accounts? Well, some mousing around and seeing, et cetera, if I, if I press the little city icon up there, I will go where I want to go to my accounts. But they shouldn't make it hard for me to find that. That doesn't look like a button. They don't want me pressing that. Even though that is exactly what I need to press to do what I want to do. 
And of course, we don't see this much anymore, but a few years back, remember when you would put Adobe Flash Player on? Anybody remember this screen? <laughs> Notice that this looks pretty much like the terms and conditions over there. It, it's just like, oh, yeah, you don't need to read this. Just, just go ahead and install. Uh, fortunately, that, that stuff's about gone. Um, other, other principles that affect what users tend to see. We've talked some about, from, about experience, but familiarity is, is a part of that. Uh, also, there's that idea of archetypes. We, we almost saw that with the elevator situation, that what shape do of a, in general, culturally speaking, the shape of an elevator button is typically round. That's almost an archetype. Um, that an expected form that's almost universal. Well, what is the expected shape of a button in computer software? Rectangular? Probably with some color or gradient behind it that stands out from the foreground. That's, that's kind of what we think a button is. So I'm at a, what, what, what kind of, oh, that was a Marriott. I was a Marriott courtyard in, in Pennsylvania trying to get on the wireless. It's about three years ago. They've changed this since then. I mean, we are seeing design start to do better. Some of these companies are getting people who, who have a clue. But, but it's a fairly recent thing. Um, and so I get on and I see this. They go, yeah, high-speed internet, that's what I want. It's free. So I press the thing that says high-speed internet because it looks like a button. It's not a button. It's a title. And if I scroll down far enough, I say, yeah, there's a button that looks just like it. <laughs> that's just beneath where, where my screen cut off. See, that's just poor design. It, it leads people into making bad things. It's frustrating. I'm punching this thing. Why, why can't I get a button? So that's, that's kind of the idea of the elevators that, that we've got. The, the round elevator, they look like buttons. They're equidistant. Just violates those principles and, and tends to make people make mistakes. Oh, I already did this one, didn't I? Yeah. I already did the American Airlines one. Yeah. Sorry. Again, I think I copied those slides and then didn't, didn't cut them from where they were. I touched a little bit on this idea of mapping earlier, where the sizes of the sports equipment should correspond to real world sizes. The whole principle of mapping is actually much bigger than that. The vi again, the visual system sees things in a certain way. And if you leverage that, you're going you're gonna to get perception correct. And if you don't, you may get it incorrect. So, so this, uh, let's see. If, uh, yeah. Um, this, it, these are diagrams showing the last two gas of ranges that I've, I've worked with. Now, I don't move very much. The first one uh, was eight years back from the late 80s to the early 90s, and then I moved into my current house and got the, the other, the, I'm sorry, the, that, that stove, will, the one on the, the left is my current range. The one on the right is the one I used for eight years back in the late 80s and early 90s. Gas ranges now. And this, I'm not exaggerating the slightest when I tell you that the eight years that I used that one, I never once turned on the wrong burner, not a single time. The last time I turned on a, the wrong burner in that one over the, in my current house was about three months ago. And I've been living in that house with that range for 26 years. What's the difference? Yeah, you've, you, you know the difference, don't you? This is what the control knobs look like in my current stove, my current range. It, at least they kind of separate the oven. But how do I know what knob goes to what burner? Well, I kind of hope the two on the left go to the left burners and two on the right go to the right burners, but which is which, I, I don't know. But the old range had an arrangement, knob arrangement that looked like this. The visual system sees those burners in perspective and that simulates that perspective so that the mapping from knob to burner is unconscious and virtually instantaneous. Given the fact that turning on the knob the wrong burner could have serious safety implications, I would think that every manufacturer, every range manufacturer in the world would have an arrangement like that because the range that I had was made back in the 60s. And yet, go looking for ranges. Let's go down to Home Depot, Lowe's, looking for a range that looks like that. Some of the very high-end expensive ones do. 
but, but you won't find many. So bad design is just everywhere. But mapping in, a, in, in software is, uh, helps us with things like the, 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 um, the, the timeline is an example of mapping. That when we put things on a timeline, we're mapping them mentally to a place in time that corresponds to their physical position. And that helps the, the, the mind understand the relationship between the items and where they map. So that's an example of mapping in, in software. You also, this doesn't happen quite as often, but context sets expectation for perception. So if I say fold napkins, polish silverware, wash dishes, but then I use a similar word, French napkins, Polish silverware. <laughs> See, your, your brain just automatically shifts sometimes on context, so you, so you need to be aware of that. Um, that, that context can set the expectation. Structure can tip off perception. So if I show you this number, what does it mean to you? Probably nothing. But if I do it like this, it's pretty obvious what it is. This one? Any guesses? Yeah. Credit card. But see, if I do it like that, it's, it's obvious and clear. How many places actually put the spaces in the credit card number when you enter them or look at them? A, a distressingly small number distressingly small percentage, even though it's much, much easier for the mind to pick up and understand that, that, uh, that there because our visual system is just tuned to filter it out if, if, it's, if it looks like gibberish. Stones on a beach, waves in the ocean. We tune things out that we don't think matter so that uh, if, if it's just a long string of digits, that looks like gibberish to us. We tune it out. That screen with all the gibberish on it, had Sherlock Holmes in the corner, but the rest of it's gibberish. Our brains just tune that gibberish right out. And you know what? It, it, uh, I, I probably should explain this to you. Um, I think of software developers as kind of a tribe of people because we like to congregate with each other and other people don't understand us very well, do they? We have kind of our own culture. I'm not really part of the tribe. I'm more like an anthropologist observing the tribe. <laughs> So I don't like C family language as much. And one of the reasons was they have too much of this kind of clutter in them. What looks like gibberish to me from which this cartoon comes. I, I, I don't understand why everybody thinks having all those different delimiters that kind of more or less sort of look alike. Uh, it, it, to me, it imposes additional cognitive load. I think there are other languages that don't do that, that, that I prefer. But then the the... Community as a whole has sort of decided on that, and my vote doesn't matter anymore. Um, you can use, you can, you can impose some structure with hierarchies, particularly in text. So if, if I put this on a website, you must apply a date, a location, and a number of people in your party. Finally, you need, okay, great. I mean, that does the job, I guess. But suppose I do it like this. Which one of those is a user going to perceive and act on correctly faster and more, and, and, and more often. So we can do things with, with structure to, to help people perceive it. Oh, I, I, I don't know why that was second. I thought that was all the same thing. Yeah. Um, and, and then we can do visual hierarchies. We can, we can use some of the separation to help people sort of see things as groups and, and hierarchies. And look, here's the Visual Studio color picker. And to me... Trans transparency, translucency of the color, the alpha channel, is a fundamentally different thing than RGB. So if I'm designing this screen, I'm moving it down to help understand that it operates. You can tell it operates differently. It's not even a number from 1 to 255, 0 to 255 is like the others. It's a percentage, although I think it probably should be. I use 0 to 255. But anyway, the, 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 the separation there helps you understand that, it, that it's that it is in a different family. And the final point I want to make in the session today is that you design expecting your users to be distracted. So some of these things are fairly subtle differences in terms of how they perceive, but they start to kick in at the margin when people get distracted. And people, are, people get distracted as a part of daily life all the time. So your design should be resistant to distraction. Unlike, let's say, this one, which is the one that Steve Harvey made the mistake of announcing the wrong Miss Universe. 
Now, if you stare at that thing long enough, it's not that hard to figure out what should happen. But think, but think about poor Steve Harvey. He's up there with bright lights in his eyes, and he's got a, you know, an earpiece in there with somebody babbling at him off stage about what he needs to do. He doesn't have, I mean, he can't just sit there and stare at the card for 30 seconds to make sure he's got it right, or even 15. He needs to glance and get it. And he glanced and got it wrong. But it wasn't his fault as far as I'm concerned. This was the famous Hawaii nuclear drill. Remember that one? Well, this could use some text hierarchy, some kind of hierarchical structure to help them not do that, right? I mean, everything is just all the same. Not very well phrased either. So you design for distractions so that people can do a better job of, of using your software error-free. Okay, um, we don't have any time. For, uh, we're out of time, aren't we? I was going to have time for questions, but it looks like I went over just a bit. I'll be taking my stuff down, getting out of here. Oh, we got lunch coming up, don't we? Okay, good. Then I don't have to be in a hurry. Anybody who would like to have ask me some questions before lunch, please come up. I have business cards, of course, uh, for anybody who might might be interested in having your team sort of get a little bit more focused on UX design or having some help in designing your UX than uh, than, than myself. And I have people who do that. So uh, come up if you like a business card or if you have any particular questions. I hope uh, hope this has been a little bit fun on the last day of the conference. Not so code centric. A little bit. Oh, give, give that part of your brain a rest. Thank you, folks. Thank um. you.